Hello, everyone. I'm Dr. Jung Young Eun, the MC of this case discussion. In the case discussion, we'll discuss the challenging cases, come up with the optimal solution, and we have invited three dentists today. Hello. Hello. Last time, we talked about immediate implant placement in the anterior region. Today, we are going to talk about the immediate placement in the posterior area. The first case, 56 male patient. The chief complaint is swelling and tenderness at number 36 and 47. After the extraction, the patient wants immediate placement. What do we need to be careful about in doing so? If you look at the x-ray, at number 36 and 47, you can see bone is resorbed. You can see the bone resorption around the number 36 on CT. Inferior alveolar nerve is running 5 or 6 millimeters below it. The same thing is happening at 47. As the teeth is more distal, it is closer to the nerve. On the CT, if your alveolar nerve is running 2 or 3 millimeters below it, the frication part has purple color, so frequent inflammation is suspected. So you've heard about the case, what do you think? Mixilla and mandible, when you do the immediate placement right after the extraction in the posterior region, it depends on whether you can get initial stability or not. The concept of immediate placement, according to Lazarus' paper, at least 3 millimeters of basal bone is required. If you look at this case, number 36, I don't think it will be very difficult to get the initial stability. In the case of 47, if you choose um, the immediate placement, you need to be really careful in terms of the drilling. I am the period specialist, so I encounter such cases quite a lot. Vacation is involved, and when it is not properly controlled, we need to extract it often. Number 36, mesial distally, interproximal bone is vital. So only the problem is limited to the furcation. In that case, there are many options to treat it periodontally. If the patient is cooperative, we don't really need to extract it. Maybe the teeth is not mobile at all, only it is not under control. And there's nothing the patient can do, so the patient um, cannot chew, so the patient really wants extraction, but there is a s ways to save the tooth. If that is not working, then we need to discuss the plan of treatment with the patient, as you said. The immediate placement can be done using the basal bone. Number 47, I frequently see such cases. We have oral surgeons here. In, if it were me, I extract the number 8 unconditionally. Because of number 8, 7 is destroyed in many cases. So the plan will be to save number 7 at the sacrifice of number 8. Maybe there are other reasons to preserve it. So in many cases, number 7 is destroyed because of 8, which is very unfortunate, like Dr. Son. Number 36 is not a problem, but number 47 requires a lot of thought for immediate placement. If you are a beginner, safely, you can extract number 7 and 8 and wait for the healing. So, I want to add one thing. 
when you talked about number 47, you talked about the extraction of number 8. What I feel as I've been with the university for a long time, number 18 or 48 are okay. So many doctors in practice will try to preserve them, but I would extract them. Number 8 would be destroyed, and number 7 is frequently destroyed. So as a surgeon, it is more important to extract the wisdom tooth. As for the number 36, as an oral surgeon, uh, because of the vacation, they cannot be saved. But if it were my family, I would bring the patient to Dr. Yang to save it. Actually, it is a little bit too late in that case. Apical involvement is observed a little bit too late. If you control the frication, it doesn't mean poor prognosis. There's a problem if it cannot be controlled. According to papers, frication involved teeth have a poor prognosis compared to those that not. But it doesn't mean it will go really bad within one or two years. So if you can control the situation, it will be better for the patient. And one more thing. In the case of number 36, as Dr. Son said, initial stability can be obtained because there is a 3 millimeter or more bone down there. In that case, period problem has been progressing for a long time, chronic illness, sclerotic change is observed in the surrounding bone. So if you are a beginner, you, you may feel some resistance in drilling below there. You need to be careful about heating up bone. As I remember it, in 2010, EAO meeting in Glasgow in the UK talked about this, when there is a lesion and frication, you need to clean up the extraction socket after extraction. Curatage is very important. So after plans placing implants, like the abscess of natural teeth, lesion can happen at the apex of implants, so scholars there said the apical lesion remains from before placing implants. When implants are inserted, the secondary lesion activation can occur leading to inflammation. In this case, it is far away from the inferior alveolar nerve, so oh, it is important to do curatage fully. 2010 EAO even said if curatage is not sufficient, a round bar is to be used to reduce the surrounding bone. Then, delayed approach would be better than the immediate placement. So we talked about the issue raised by a viewer. Dr. Son has prepared a presentation for a similar case. So immediate placement after extraction is mainly for extraction for periodontal reasons or fracture due to accident or even endo reasons. In the posterior region, when basal bone is sufficient for immediate placement, I uh, will talk about that under that assumptions. Number 36 and number 7 in this patient um, have very severe mobility. Dr. Yang is watching this, so he may not agree with the extraction of those teeth, but I did it anyway and decided to do the immediate placement. This is an um, extraction for periodontal reasons, so a simple forcep delivery. A buccal gingiva is cut by mistake. 
so it's extracted. I did the curatage, but it didn't work, so eventually they were extracted. In the posterior region, in most cases, I raise the flap. That's the first principle in oral surgery. We need to secure the visibility for a good outcome, according to my teacher. So based on the posterior region of mandible, septal bone is observed in the lower posterior area. People say drilling into the septum is very challenging. And that is true. When the septum bone is thick, it's not a problem. But when septum bone is thin or resorbed, that's a problem. Exactly into the center point of the septum, we need to drill. There are some tools and options to do it. Um, a path drill from Ostom is available to do the drilling without displacement. So using the tools would be a good idea. As you can see, the buckle bone should remain. So it is placed a little bit lingually. In the lower posterior region, we need to be careful about the ang angulation. It shouldn't be inclined the buckley. The drilling direction must be in line with the natural inclination of mandible. So initial drilling is a little bit lingually done. The same for the final drilling. So it's a little bit lingual. Number six, implant is placed. For number seven, septum is almost non-existent. So we need to prevent the displacement uh, to the maximum. To prevent the displacement of Lindemann drill or twist drill, we need to be aware that uh, the drill rotates in the clockwise direction. So if you apply pressure in the same direction, the displacement will get larger. Therefore, you need to apply pressure on the drill in the counterclockwise direction to reduce the displacement. Vertically, uh, if I say my opinion, it doesn't mean much. So, uh, based on papers, marginal gingiva cannot be a good reference point. So, proximal bone CJ or marginal gingiva of adjacent tooth can be the reference point when you raise a flap. So the gap is filled after the placement. After the gap filling, I make sure it is covered with a membrane. Some people do not agree with that. If you, even if you get the primary closure from the soft tissue, the membrane helps as well in terms of the bone regeneration volume. This is much more beneficial. Therefore, uh, my recommendation is to use the membrane over it. Transmucosal GBR is completed like this. Healing abutments, using them is not a problem in this patient. These days, my graft concept is changed. Porcine bone, xenogenic bone is used, but in the past, I never used it in a socket. Now, I begin to use it little by little for various reasons. Compared to bovine bone, porcine bone shows some remodeling as it has bigger porosity, so it's safer. Post up CT after delivery of prosthesis, as you can see closely. If you use xenogenic bone, the grafted part of the socket, you can see the blackening on the x ray, which doesn't go away. I talked about the implant placement immediately after extraction for periodontal reasons. I believe if you follow the procedure that I have described, you will be able to do the immediate placement successfully. Thank you. 
Dr. Son explained with a case. What do you think, Dr. Kim and Dr. Yang? Drilling into the septal bone is easier said than done, as we say. And Dr. Son said that we need to apply a little bit of pressure in the counterclockwise direction. We saw a sclerotic change in the case raised by our viewer. And then it would be difficult in this case. Then we can opt for two-stage approach. And we have a various uh, digital guide or guided surgery tools, and uh, we can use it. I believe it is not easy to drill into a septal bone. If you are a beginner, especially at number 36, the septal bone is hardly there. If there is a septal bone, then if you make a deviation while drilling, mesial displacement is a little bit more favorable than the distal one. So cantilever in the distal side is better. So it is very important to, to drill into the septal bone correctly, especially in the lower posterior region where two roots are there. That was a very good case. And if we can do that, we really don't need a digital guide. Dr. Yang, when the period situation is not very good, actually, I have brought a case. In this patient, orthognetic surgery was done. After that, number 16 is extracted because it was not very good. If you look at overall, number 17 has poor prognosis from the periodontal perspective. The patient or hygiene is not very good. So we need to have some criteria to determine whether we will do extraction or not. Based on the criteria, we thought it's better to do uh, the extraction. So 17 is to be extracted. I talked to the prosthodontist and uh, he said he will do the immediate loading if the implant position is pretty good, so I felt pressure. So this is not a digital CT, but uh, it is a um, paper CT view of the patient. Number seven, the position is pretty good. Number six position has enough bone. That's what we expected. And the problem was how to get the stability, how to deal with the sinus. At that time, Austin developed a pretty good product, so I used them. As Dr. Son said, in the posterior region, I tend to raise a flap in almost all cases when multiple teeth are involved and the teeth are extracted and the check the bone position and implants were placed. After that, the gap is filled with the contour GBR. On the day, immediate loading was done using a temporary. In the middle, we took a panorama x-ray to check Number 17, the sinus is elevated, so teeth were extracted and uh, implants were placed simultaneously and uh, using a crystal approach, sinus was elevated and prosthesis are delivered. Implants were planned for another region, so in 2020, a digital CT was taken at number 6 and 7. At number six, there's enough space buckley, but as the portion is remodeled over seven years, the cortical bone still remains, but 
surrounding bone is remodeled and the bone is reduced. The prosthodontist asked me to position the implants well, so it was awkwardly positioned. Anyway, it went pretty well. For immediate placement, the positions are pretty good. And the sinus graft is also pretty well maintained. Even though you extract an posterior tooth, you can do immediate placement, but like in this case, it is not easy to get stability there. If you are skilled, I don't think there is a problem. However, as uh, he gave us a tip, the drill rotates in the clockwise direction. Making a drill hole to obtain stability is not easy using a very thin septal bone. Lower posterior is more challenging. On the maxilla, septal bone can be thicker in many cases. Even period situation is not very good. So if you consider that, you'll be able to get good outcome. So various options have been described. I hope this has been helpful to you. Let's go to the second case. The patient is 36-year-old female. Chief complaint is swelling and mobility at number 25. The story is that the patient wants implant placement. On the x-ray, we can see bone resorption at the root apex. Can I place the implant immediately after extraction? Bone around the number 25 is resorbed. The sinus floor is lowered toward the root of the tooth. In the upper posterior, sinus pneumatization is always a concern. So you heard about the case and what do you think? So I prepared a similar case due to endo treatment or canal treatment infection occurs. So I have prepared a mandible case, not maxilla. After canal treatment, a lot of root fracture occurred and the patient does not know about it. After a long time passed, gum boil appeared and he came to us and said something erupted. And I said, I need to extract them. And uh, the patient said, they're not mobile. Why do you have to extract them? So I explained and placed these implants. After extraction, which was not simple, the roots are severely bent. As Dr. Son talked about the drilling tip, I drilled this in a similar way and there is no problem if we can get a stability, but in the mesobuccal root, there is a fistula and how to treat that is a major concern. As the case under discussion, I could see fistula. I don't treat it really. As you can see, this is the finished status. I didn't put in bone either. This is a little bit different from Dr. Son's case. If you look at here, we can see the mesial root and the distal root. I didn't raise a flap. The bone, outer surface of the bone is always checked. As you can see, the placement positions. He talked about the aliens papers. I thought I could secure four millimeter space, so I didn't give any treatment. Sometimes giving treatment can be more dangerous. If you are not sure how to treat the infected mesiobuccal root, you'd better leave it alone. So leaving it untreated is better, so I didn't treat it here. And implants are placed and healing abutments were connected and uh, stability was obtained. If you look at how I drilled, so the drill hole exists below the apex of implant. I didn't 
placed to the full length of the drill hole. So they are healed and prosthesis are delivered. I didn't put it anything, but still, from the buckle side, it looks good, but from the occlusal surface, the mesial buccal root portion is clearly resorbed where I didn't put anything. So I didn't take a CT. I will check that later when the patient comes back. So a little bit of resorption is appearing after extraction. That much is okay as we did that on the basis of clear criteria. So without bone grafting, we can obtain the desired outcome that we want. So this is a little bit different case. Thank you. Dr. Son used the bone grafting after extraction and Dr. Yang didn't do the bone grafting. I agree with both of them. I do flap list for anterior to preserve the labial bone, but in the posterior, I agree with raising a flap. There are advantages of flap list approach, like less pain to a patient, but in the posterior region, I don't think raising a flap would give more pain to a patient, so raising a flap is a good idea. As Professor Yang said, more important thing is to scrape out the lesion thoroughly. If you look at here, the fistula on the buccal side is not removed using fistulectomy and it is naturally healed. That means removing the source of lesion is very important. In the Dr. Yang's case, if the apical lesion was not uh, properly scraped out, um, the fistula would not have disappeared. So in the posterior, it is better to raise a flap to check the buccal bone. Thank you. Dr. Son, I heard you have a similar case. Would you explain? It's not really a sim similar case. I heard about uh, Dr. Yang's procedure, but I have not tried it because I'm a sort of wimp. So, if you look at the case under discussion, there is the lesion surely on the buccal or palatal side, bone plate is lost. So, how to do the immediate placement when there is a defect at a site? This is not a very simple case. In this patient, number 24 is floating when the patient came to me. The buccal plate and palatal bone is seriously lost. When we do immediate placement, buccal plate or lingual plate, if one of them remain, it is much less challenging. However, if both plates are gone, it's very difficult case. Collagen membrane can be sufficient if one plate remains, but here collagen membrane is not good enough to maintain the space. Basal bone remains, so I thought there would be no problem in obtaining the initial stability. If you look at the picture, it is very much swollen and it has degree 3 mobility. So it is extracted and two vertical releasing incisions are made to raise a flap. As expected, the labial bone plate is non-existent. The problem is there is no palatal bone as well. If one plate bone is missing, collagen membrane can be used because it's a self-contained defect so no problem with the bone regeneration. However, in this case, both bone plates are missing, so rigid membrane was decided to be used. In this patient, as you can see, 
as Dr. Kim said, allograft is used surrounding the implant. Genic bone is used on the outside. Ostem has very good product. Just uh, one year ago, I came to know about this product. It's OB3 that can cover both walls. So it's a titanium mesh that is used here to fix. One more collagen membrane covers the site and it is closed for immediate placement when walls are missing. More rigid membrane or coverage needs to be used for better predictability. So if both walls are missing, rigid membrane needs to be used. Surgery went well on the CT. There is a huge augmented volume on the outside. Us builder is rigidly holding the site, so it is very well maintained. To remove the membrane at month 4, re-entry was made and there's no inflammation at all. It holds both walls, therefore it is very difficult to remove it. But the outcome is very good, good enough to offset the difficulty. The second surgery is done and prosthesis is delivered. On the CT, before surgery, the bony outline plan is maintained. It is pretty much overcrafted to respond to the remodeling. So when there is a defect at the site, as I showed you in the first case, pliable membrane would not work for this type of outcome, so you need to think a bit differently. We can do as Professor Yang did, but as most of us who have private practice, we prefer to have a more visible outcome with a better predictability. So that would be better. Therefore, I showed you a case from a very different perspective. Thank you very much for the case. In this case, there is no bone at the buccal and lingual size. And um, where do we need to place? How deep do we need to go? CJ should be the reference. No, as you can see on the x-ray, it is um, seated 2 millimeters deeper on the apical side deeper than normal. To get the volume, we need a space and also space for membrane. Therefore, it is a bit placed deeper. For the internal submerged type of implants, if you place it too shallow, say there's a hundred problems, then you will have five problems by placing it too deep. So if you place it a little bit deeper, it will be easier to handle and maintain, provided it's um, internal submerged type of implants. Thank you very much. We talked about a lot of things. Lastly, regarding the case under discussion, do you have anything else? As Dr. Son showed us, there's a no palatal bone. If there were palatal bone, it could have been much easier. In that case, in my view, titanium mesh. I don't have a good memory when I was a resident, so I don't really use them very well. But the preformed OS builder from Austin has better predictability and it generates good outcome. As Dr. Son said, when the buccal mucosa is thin, outside of titanium mesh, collagen membrane can be applied. In this case, as I view it, on the standard picture, what should I say? The sinus 
looked pretty close, but in this case, if apical lesion is thoroughly removed, this looks like this because of the angle. I don't think sinus will be perforated. Even sinus is perforated, if, I, if it were me, I would not do bone graft in the sinus. From the sinus floor, we can get stability. So curettage should be done thoroughly. Placing deep would be okay. I don't think sinus would be any problem after extraction, as Dr. Son and Dr. Yang said, thorough curettage is very important in this case. So the infection source should be controlled if you cannot do it. A two-stage approach can be an answer if you want an immediate placement. In this case, I believe curettage is the most important thing. Dr. Yang, this case is a very special case. Usually, the premolar area, buccolingually it is wide and mesodistally it is narrow, so we can get enough stability from the mesodistal wall. So, premolar area is easy to do immediate placement, but in this case, it is hard to get the stability from the side wall when we place four or 4.5 millimeter implants because it is wide there. As doctor said, we are afraid of the residual bone. Therefore, we need to measure the dimensions accurately. As I showed you in my case, sinus elevation is not that difficult. And Austin has very good instruments for that. Using the instruments, sinus elevation can be done at the same time. But this is not general premolar area. Therefore, getting stability is the key. Infection source and granulation tissue remaining there should be thoroughly removed. Thank you. Immediate placement after Extraction is more challenging than placing in healed reach. Depending on where implants will be placed, we need to th consider different factors. It sounds complicated, but as Dr. Kim and Dr. Yang said, we need to adhere to the basic principles. As Professor Yang and Dr. Kim gave us very good explanation I don't really have anything more to add, but if there's a defect, we need to consider that seriously. And uh, initial stability is very important. So you need to take one step at a time, and I believe you will get pretty good result. So we talked about the immediate placement in posterior region. Uh, I'd like to thank the dentist who raised this issue. I hope this discussion has been helpful to you. Dr. Kim, Dr. Yang, Dr. Son, thank you very much for joining us. I am Dr. Jung Young Un. I'll see you next time. Thank you very much. Thank you very much.